I'm the uh, director of the Princeton Learning Project, uh, which is the, the organization sponsoring the talk tonight. Uh, thank you. So this is a great crowd. Um, lovely. Um, so, and I think you're all in for a treat tonight. Um, I met, I don't know if we met, but I, I heard Blake Bowles um, uh, seven years ago, maybe when the first book came out. Um, and I remember really being impressed by that. Um, and just sort of following what he's been doing over the years. Uh, and then when I saw an email came through that he was making an East Coast swing. He mostly hangs out on the West Coast. Uh, but he was making a swing through the East Coast. I was like, any chance you're coming to the Princeton area? It happened to be tonight. And we're like, all right, well, we've got to do something. Um, so we were lucky enough to, to snag him for the evening. Uh, so Blake is uh, the director, founder and director of Unschool Adventures. I'll let him explain more about what that is, just doing really cool things with young people. Uh, and is also uh, the author of a number of books, um, which are for sale back there, by the way, if you haven't gotten a copy yet. Um, college Without High School, Better Than College, and the most recent one, The Art of self uh, which I have bought and gifted to a number of people. It's called a short course, six-week course on the Art of Self-Directed Learning uh, last year at TLC, uh, which was just a great experience. So I will stop talking now. Joel and Katie and Allison is not here were kind enough to show me around Princeton University and buy me dinner. Mm -hmm. And this this is a free event, but are you accepting donations for the for you, not for us. Not for you, okay. So buy my books. <laughs> <laughs> I'm really appreciative to be hosted by them. So, hi, I'm Blake, and this is about the book, The Red One, The Art of Self-Directed Learning, and let's just get into it. When I was 11, I went away to summer camp for the first time, and I didn't brush my teeth for two weeks. It was awesome. I never felt freedom like that before. I went back the next year, age 12, and I met a girl who was 14, and I told her that I was 13. Because back then, you know, it makes a big difference uh, whether you're 12 or 13. Right? 12 year olds are kids, 13 year olds are somehow magically different. Anyways, we like dated, which meant like held hands for two days. And then she found out that I was actually 12 and she broke up with me. And I learned that lying to make people like you doesn't work very well. Uh, two summers later, I went back again at age 15 to do the most challenging backpacking trip. This is a wilderness camp in California. I'll talk about it a little bit more later in the presentation. But they have two night, three day backpacking trips. And the most challenging one is called the ascent. And on the ascent trip, you have to interview to get onto the backpacking trip. And then once you're on there, you and the other members of the trip plan the entire route. You plan which food you're taking, how many stops you're gonna take. If you wanna do a crazy, you know, up and over four mountains in one day, uh, you can try to do that. Or if, uh, like me, you find some natural water slides along the way and decide that we're just going to stop here for the next two and a half, two days and play on the water slides and eat orange drink mix, drink mix powder right out of the bag, then that's what you do. And that's what we did. And that's what I'm doing. And again, I never felt uh, such freedom, but it, was, it wasn't just freedom to do whatever we wanted. It was freedom matched with uh, responsibility and with some actual decision-making power. And so summer camp made a big impact on me, but I didn't really realize the impact until uh, a little bit later. I was going to California public schools and went to generally good schools and generally suburban neighborhoods, and I did well in math and science, and so I did what you're supposed to do when you do well in school, and I went straight to college. And I got into, I went to the best school I could get into, which was Berkeley, and I studied the most impressive sounding major that I could choose, which was astrophysics. <laughs> and yeah, it's like, oh, astrophysics at Berkeley, that makes you sound really smart, right? And so we're all about impressions uh, nowadays, and I have to make a good one on myself. Um, I think, though, in retrospect, the real reason I wanted to study astrophysics was because I watched the movie Contact in 1997 with uh, Matthew McConaughey, Jodie Foster. Jodie Foster is the astrophysicist who communicates with extraterrestrials, and then they beam down instructions to build a machine, and she gets to be the passenger in the machine and goes to another universe. And 
and Matthew McConaughey is this hunky, like, religious guy, and they have this science and religion conversation. And I'm like, oh, that's obviously what every astrophysicist does. <laughs> so I'll do that. And that delusion went pretty well for two years. And I did all the undergrad, uh, the prereq stuff before I got into the really heavy upper division classes. And what really made me realize that I was being delusional was a class called Quantum Mechanics which is a physics course in which no longer is physics something you can see and visualize and tell people, tell little kids about, okay? It's no longer blocks sliding down planes with certain coefficients of friction. It's just math. It's just equations. And I could tolerate math, and I could do it just barely well enough to get through the physics. But once I hit this, I was like, uh-oh, a little light went off. Like, I'm going to be a really crappy research scientist. I saw my path, and I said, well, I, I always have my backup plan of being a high school science teacher. I know that I like summer camps. I know that I like working with young people, especially teenagers. And so that was my default plan. And so I was thinking, okay, maybe I'll just keep writing out this major, make you know, just graduate, and then I'll figure out what I can do. And then this guy happened. Oh, oh wait. Oh, I jumped ahead. I'm so sorry. Let me tell you a little bit about summer camp versus real life. Here are a few more details. At summer camp, I had control over my schedule, versus at school, I had no schedule control. It's just, here, show up, do this, go to the next class. At camp, I could go really deep into my interests. If I wanted to learn windsurfing, I took windsurfing classes, and that's what I did at summer camp. At school, we're sort of forced to just go, you can only go a little deep into a lot of different subjects. If you're really into physics, if you're really into history, if you're really into woodworking, you can't really go that deep into it. There's a sort of prohibition against mastery. <laughs> Social life was fairly traumatic for me. Uh, as soon as I went into middle school, I realized that I had to join a tribe. Because if you don't, if you're not a tribe, you know, the only thing worse than being part of the, the lower caste in the middle school hierarchy is not being part of any caste. And so I joined these skaters. And I learned how to skate and, you know, bought the appropriate clothing. But I never really fit in. And they kind of kicked me out of the tribe in ninth grade anyways. But at camp, I just got to show up as myself and be a social free dancer. At camp, uh, I was just treated again like a person who had interests. And at school, I was treated like my test scores, which were pretty good in school, and so I got treated well. But it still didn't feel good to see how the other kids who didn't get good test scores were treated. And also, there was this pernicious effect of those who did get good test scores, we became kind of like lap dogs. And the idea of doing something different or kind of deviating from the, the mainstream path became more and more difficult as we accumulated more and more gold stars. Kind of became emotionally dependent upon that. And finally, I went to camp because I chose to. I got asked by my parents, would you like to go to summer camp? And I got to say yes or no. And at school, it was just September, time for school. OK, sorry for the retrogression. So going back, I had all these camp experiences. And then I went through college, and I was like, Ugh, maybe physics, maybe I'll become a high school science teacher. And then this guy happened to me. Raise your hand if you know who this is. Oh, about 96% of you are in for a treat tonight. Because this guy is somebody who you should Google immediately. Uh, not like right now. <laughs> And his name is John Taylor Gatto, G-A-T-T-O. And he taught in New York City public schools, both some of the best, some of the worst, for 30 years. And the final year of his career, 1991, he won New York City Teacher of the Year for the third time in a row, and New York State Teacher of the Year. <coughs> and that same year, 1991, he wrote an op-ed to the Wall Street Journal that said, that he no longer wants to make, make a living hurting kids anymore. And he quit teaching forever. Hurting, H-E-R-D, or? Hurting. <laughs> <laughs> hurting also. Hurting. <laughs> now, he won these awards because he had done all sorts of innovative stuff, getting public school kids out of the classrooms into the community, doing projects, doing internships. Uh, you know, going and researching all the best public pools in the area were, and creating a, a document that they could share. Uh, going and seeing how much it costs to outfit an apartment in Manhattan, and how much average rent prices are in different neighborhoods. 
I remember there's a great video online called Classrooms of the Heart in which he uh, has these two like 12 year old middle school girls and he's helping them like, get into the, the cab of a long haul truck and they're doing a job shadow with a long haul truck driver. So he did all this cool stuff, he was an English teacher, um, and while still like managing the responsibilities of the classroom, but after 30 years and after winning all these awards, he said, it's too much, it doesn't work, the system is broken, and he started writing and lecturing widely on what he sees as the problems and the solutions. And so I picked up his book called A Different Kind of Teacher. It was given to me by a friend. And I, it was one of those books where you pick it up and uh, it's like two hours later, someone says, oh, it's dinner time, you're like, oh, I'll be right there. And then two hours later, you know, and it just distractions melt away. And so I just consumed this book. And the next thing I had to do was go into Amazon and find all the related books. People who purchased John Taylor Gatto also purchased Grace Llewellyn, who wrote the Teenage Liberation Handbook. Also purchased A.S. Neal, who wrote Summerhill. Also purchased uh, Dan Greenberg and Mimsy Sadovsky, who wrote the Sudbury Valley School books. And on and on and on. And I essentially consumed all these books uh, about alternative schools, about critical theory and education. And within a matter of weeks, I said, that's it. Sign me up. I pretty much realized I didn't want to go into the system that so many people had eloquently written about attempting to uh, work with and ultimately failing and giving up out of frustration. And so that's when I gave up on my backup dream of becoming a high school science teacher and decided to get into the world of alternative education. Berkeley did not have a major called uh, hippie schooling, and so <laughs> I had to create my major, which turned out to be a blessing in disguise. Uh, I created a major which, I, if you want to know, the official uh, lowest value college major to graduate with today, and I humbly submit mine, which was called Alternative Schooling and Science Education. That's it. That's what I called my major. It just gave me an excuse for the last two years of college to choose every single class that I wanted to choose to do independent study, to do internships. Essentially a self-designed, self-directed college major. I do thank Berkeley for having its hippie legacy, because they had something called the individual major, where you just get to choose all your classes, and you get two professors to sign off on it and say you're not crazy, and then you, you do whatever you want. And I wrote a really bad senior thesis paper also. Um, and so that was it. That was the beginning of the end. Um, after graduating, I worked in outdoor education for a few years. It's a really big, th big thing in California. It's a slightly smaller thing on the East Coast. Essentially taking groups of fifth graders hiking in the woods and being like, there's a salamander and they all scream, and then I try to impart some brief science lesson, and they're really ignoring me because they're more interested in the salamander. Um, that was fun, but it was too short. I had kids for three days or five days, and just as soon as you get to know their names and build up some rapport with them, they're gone, and the next group comes in. It's very in and out. So I was wondering about what to do next, and I managed to get myself hired at this place, which eventually became equally as important as whatever Gatto said to me. This is not back to school camp. I'm actually wearing some of their propaganda right now. <laughs> it is the preeminent summer camp for teenagers who don't go to school. And it happens every year in August and September during the back to school time period in Oregon and Vermont. And so I got to meet, for the first time, a group of roughly 100 teenagers from all across North America and Canada who had opted out of the school system. And this was important because I come at alternative education from a very academic perspective, like reading books about theory and about how kids do in, in the alternative school. And then, like face to face with all of them, and I have 10 of them, and I have an advising group every day, and we're, we're talking, and I'm like, oh my God, talk about education stuff with them? No, they just turned out to be like some of the coolest, most respectful, sharp, empathetic, uh, just like nice kids I've ever worked with. They're the type of teenagers who, unlike in a regular high school, if I go up and talk to, I haven't been back to many regular high schools, but um, if I go up and talk to um, a typical teenager, there's a good chance that that kid won't make eye contact with or if they talk to me, they'll kind of immediately box me into this, like, you are the enemy, you are the authority figure, you are different from me, uh, type of attitude. And these kids would go up, and they would talk to me as if I was an individual. 
as if we were peers. We weren't quite peers because I was in the position of authority. Uh, but just being able to talk to an adult and have a real adult conversation, that was a powerful thing. And so I said, OK, hmm. I don't really like working in outdoor education. It's too you know, high, high turnover. Um, I would recently had a, a quarter life crisis after deciding I didn't want to be in outdoor education anymore. Ran away to South America for three months and discovered Argentina, which is awesome. And I said, man, I really love traveling. I'd love to go back to South America. And then I met all these kids. And I said, wait a second. I've run summer camps before. I've led trips before. How about I try to lead trips for teenagers who don't go to school to foreign countries for long periods of time? Kill like eight birds with one stone. <laughs> And lo and behold, I offered a trip to the not back to school camp community to Argentina for six weeks back in 2008. And they actually signed up. And they gave me money. And all of a sudden, I had this very small, uh, minorly profitable business that let me be self-employed. That was one other bird that I killed. I no longer really wanted to work for anyone else. It's, I think it's kind of something that comes with the unschooling lifestyle. You kind of get a lot of entrepreneurs represented in this world. And so this has been my life for the past eight years uh, from a trip in New Zealand in 2013. I get to take teenagers who don't go to school on trips to other countries or on programs here in the US. And so this was a six week New Zealand trip that we did. We were overlooking Queenstown on the South Island. And it's like cultural immersion plus uh, some language practice plus a lot of independent uh, experiences. And so it's been a really cool ride so far. And what's nice about it is that I've gotten the chance to talk and get to know, uh, talk with, and get to know teenagers who haven't been to school either for a long period of time or as dropouts um, really well. Because I get to travel with a group of like 10 of them for six weeks. Like that's the total antithesis of the outdoor education churning out lifestyle. And I realized later from talking to friends who were teachers that even teachers who get to work with a group of kids for nine months out of the year or maybe years on end don't necessarily get that chance to build up uh, you know, a deep sense of rapport or friendship or understanding. Because you have 30 of them and a bunch of other responsibilities. So anyways, this is my life. Other stuff that I've done along the way is think about some of the problems that exist in the world of education and try to put some thoughts together. And so the first one, uh, I noticed in the homeschooling world, a lot of people would say homeschooling is cool for ages zero through 12, or zero through 14. But after that, let's get serious, okay? If you want to get into a decent college, you have to go to high school. And have a good GPA, a good transcript, and of course, a high school diploma, because we all know how often we talk about our high school diplomas. <laughs> <laughs> and I was meeting all these kids not back to school camp who'd never went to high school, and we're getting into really good colleges, including you know some top colleges. And I just interviewed them. I said, what do you do? And they said, oh, well, you know, take some community college classes, and, you know, I study for the SAT, and, and you know, my mom helps me make a transcript of all the cool, weird stuff that I've done. And yeah, I pretty much got into every college that I applied to. This needs to be known. So that's the, that was the impetus for the first book, College Without High School. And then, if you remember back in 2011, a few years after the recession had kind of kicked everyone's butts, uh, there was this growing awareness of the increasing cost of college tuition, largely private school tuition, but public also. And you might have seen this great graph of, uh, over the past 30 years, the uh, consumer price index, so you know, bread, milk, that kind of stuff, was slowly creeping up like this, just general inflation. And then after that, there was the price of health care, you know, going, whoa, my gosh, an appalling increase in the cost of health care. And the only thing getting more expensive than health care by a long shot was college tuition rates going up like this. And uh, you know, a number of the not back to school campers who I worked with uh, went to college and a number opted out because they saw this logic of like, well, if I can do pretty well without secondary education, is it possible that I can continue doing well without higher education? And so I followed them and I tracked them and I talked to other people who had opted out of college or started going and then dropped out of college and that was the impetus for the second book, How You Can Build a Successful Life Without a Four-Year Degree. And this was especially written for those who are going to go into deep amounts of debt for an education of questionable personal value or utility to them. And so, again, this is my life. I get to think about cool problems and take kids on trips around the world. It's great. Um, oh, 
Jeez. <laughs> so, the, uh, something that I picked up along the way also was a little bit of hostility, personal hostility, I speak only for myself, to the word unschooling. Unschooling is, uh, does anyone know who coined the word unschooling? Shout John it out Holt. if you know it. John Holt? Who? Holt. Holt. Holt, yes. John Holt, the educator who was really active in the 60s and 70s. And he wanted to help people who were homeschooling, but not doing it in the very stereotyped, like, uh, highly uh, sheltered, religious family type of homeschooling. Uh, he wanted to help them differentiate themselves uh, and be more about self-directed learning. And so he used the word unschooling. And almost as soon as he coined the word unschooling, he regretted it, because it's not a good word. It just means not schooling. And what does that mean? Nothing. You can't define something by its negative. And so, as I was getting more into this world of unschooling, because that's primarily who goes to this camp and who are going on my trips, I realized that there was, uh, there was a lot of kids who were doing unschooling well. And then there were some families who were doing weird stuff and had weird beliefs associated with unschooling. And the one that uh, chafed me the most were, were people who thought that unschooling meant uh, not school and therefore nothing that looks like school. Nothing that is structured, no teachers, no classes, none of that. And to me, that felt like throwing the baby out with the bathwater. If you're an unschooler and you decide I'm interested in biology, and there's a homeschooling co-op, and there's a biology teacher teaching a class, and if your family philosophy is structure is bad, you must do everything on your own, like reinvent the wheel over and over again, I don't think that's a good philosophy. And unschooling, the word, is part of the problem. And so that's when I started gravitating towards a better term, and one that PLC uses, and a PLC uh, is based off of the North Star model of Massachusetts, a term that they use. It's self-directed learning, and it's a positive vision that includes lots of different types of education, including formal, structured, including highly structured education. I think you can go to West Point and still be a self-directed learner. If you're doing it voluntarily, that just a moment. So I have become a cheerleader for self-directed learning. <laughs> this is my new job. And uh, this is a really weird and disturbing photo. <laughs> and something that I've learned is that if you work with really cool, creative teenagers, they will create, uh, they will Photoshop your face, they will grab your face off of Facebook and Photoshop it onto other people's bodies. And then start a Facebook page called Blake Club. And uh, Facebook.com slash Blake Club. You too can like this page. I have no authorship or control over it. <laughs> so, this presentation is a few of the stories from the book, The Art of self Learning. Hey, there it is. Okay, first story. Who knows who this young woman is? Raise your hand if you do. One. She has such a great story. Okay, this is Laura Decker. She is a Dutch citizen, and she grew up Salem. She was born on a sailboat in New Zealand. She spent her first five years living with her family on the open ocean. Uh, she started uh, playing around on her own boat shortly after that, and at age 12, she solo sailed from the Netherlands to England, like across the English Channel by herself. Maybe a dog. I'm not sure about that. <laughs> At age 13, she declared to the world her intention to become the youngest solo circumnavigator of the world. The current record was 16. She needed to do it before I think it was some fraction of her 16th birthday. This attracted a lot of attention, and it especially attracted the attention of the Dutch government, essentially the, their equivalent of child protective services, <laughs> who said, in so many words, we think that what you are doing, Laura, with the support of your parents, who are sailors, um, is highly irresponsible for two reasons. One, you're putting your life in danger. And two, you're going to fall dangerously behind in your studies. <laughs> that was literally something that they said. As far as number one goes, uh, Laura and her family like made sure that safety was not going to be a uh, concern. They totally outfitted her, deck, uh, her, um, her boat with all the most recent equipment. She had all the safety protocols down. Like She had that set. And she had this wealth of experience. So that was not the primary concern. 
Uh, the secondary concern, she, you know, she just kind of acquiesced. She went along and said, okay, we're essentially, I'm going to be a homeschooler on this boat for the next year and a half. So she said, let's work together to figure out how I can study algebra while I'm on the Pacific Ocean. And it was, they were very accommodating, but still the government persisted. And at one point, they said, uh, we are making Laura the ward, a ward of the court. Like, we are taking over parental control of her. Because we don't think that this is it. It turned into a, a big publicity thing, so they kind of had something to do with that. Laura responded by running away to the uh, Caribbean island of St. Martin. And then she came back. She didn't want to be a refugee. Uh, what happened, what ensued, was a year-long legal battle in which Laura and her parents and this international community of educators and sailors uh, all got together and fought this courtroom. And it took about a year, but eventually a second judge overturned the first judge's order, and Laura was released from the protection of the court. And three weeks later, she set sail. And uh, a year and a half after that, became the youngest person to ever sail around the globe by herself. To me, Laura represents some essence, some core of self-directed learning. It starts with this desire to do something that is beyond the norm, beyond the mainstream, beyond what is just presented to you as the default. And then, when somebody says, actually, no, you shouldn't do that, whether it's a, uh, someone in a bureaucratic position, whether it's an extended family member, whether it's a sibling, they say, you're really going to screw up, it, you kind of have to fight for it what you believe is your inherent freedom uh, and your ability to pursue your own path. That's what Laura's story represents to me. Of course, I wouldn't want to set the bar that high for being a self-directed learner, right? <laughs> this is a real outlier case, okay? I see some of you shaking your hands like, yeah, that's not a good example. <laughs> that's way too extreme. I agree with you. So I'm going to continue other vignettes about what self-directed learning looks like. But that, she has some essence of it right there. Okay, this next story is from my own life. Uh, right after I finished Berkeley, I was so hungry to just do anything that was hands-on. Just not intellectual anymore. Just let me do something with these things that have gone to waste for 12, 16 years. And what I decided to do was take an EMT class, emergency medical technician, because I realized I could get it for free through California community colleges because I was an impoverished recent graduate. And it's really helpful to have an EMT certification when you're working at summer camps, you're trip leading. And so I signed up for this course in South Lake Tahoe, California. And I was so excited, I got my $100 you know, textbook. I go into the class and I sit down and I'm thinking, I grew up watching among other things, Seinfeld, Simpsons, and ER. And ER, there's so, all sorts of crazy stuff that happened in that show. And so I was thinking, oh, I'm gonna get a, I'm gonna find out how to take a big pen and stick it into somebody's trachea when they can't breathe anymore, or stop massive arterial bleeding. Instead, we sit down in this class, and the first thing that we covered for a couple of days is consent, which is not a word I ever really thought too much about. And they said, as a medical professional, if you go and try to help somebody without asking their consent first, you can actually hurt them more than you help them. For example, if you come onto the scene of a car crash, and you're just some gun ho rescuer, and you run and you try to extricate the person in the car from the vehicle, you can actually kill them that way. They have, you know, a compromise on them. And the same way, if you go and, you know, there's a, a six-year-old who is distressed and their parents over here on the phone, and you go help the six-year-old without getting consent from the parents first, you can get yourself in legal hot water. And so the basic idea was, before you want to help someone, ask them if you can help. It's like, that makes a lot of sense to me. Great. Glad I learned about this. And then this little light went off in my head, and I thought, hmm, I wonder anyone ever asked me if I wanted to go to school? <laughs> huh. Wow. And all, I have wonderful, loving parents, and they provided me with many opportunities, and also, part of our family discussion was never do you want to go to school. It was just the default. It was assumed, it was you're doing this because everyone else is doing this, and that's how you become successful. Consent was not part of my education. 
until much later on. And I realized that that was really the key to self-directed learning, right there. I found it, and it was consent. It doesn't matter if you or your kid wants to go to uh, some crazy, you know, highly structured class, like the you know, equivalent of a West Point. If you're making a fully informed, consensual decision about that, that's self-directed learning. If your kid wants to play Minecraft all day long, maybe you feel really uncomfortable with that. And you want to have a discussion about all the other magical things that this world has to offer beyond Minecraft. But if your kid will not actively consent to those other ones, and you are going to be coercing them into it, then maybe that's not self-directed learning. It just hit the nail on the head. And then a friend, another staff member at Not Back to School Camp, who I met years later, Ethan Mitchell, uh, he used these words, and he said, all self-directed learning is consensual learning. That doesn't, you know, I'm not going to go around saying I'm a consensual educator, because that just sounds weird. And <laughs> but that's it. That's correct. That is the heart of what makes self-directed learning work and how it builds relationships with young people. Right, Mecca, done. We're there. I'm just going to end the presentation. <laughs> so before you want to help someone, ask them. Before you're so sure that you're going to enrich your child's life with some sort of magical activity, get consent first. Or just demo it yourself. If you're so, you know, you really want your kid to learn piano, if, you know, my kid is named Matt, and I want my kid Matt to learn piano, the map is so resistant to it. I think I can explain all, all the good options, like different ways I can help him learn piano. I can give him you know, ways to do it this way or that way. I can, uh, I can try my best to explain why I think it's important, but fundamentally, if he doesn't want to do it, then I'm not going to force him to do it, because that's going to be destructive to my relationship with Matt. And that's probably the most important thing I've yet to do. And if I still feel antsy, I'm going to go sign up for piano lessons myself. And lead by example. Somebody else explain this better. Uh, this is uh, a homeschooling mom who I follow on Facebook. And she was responding to the question, don't you make your children learn anything? And here's how she responded. Make? No. I don't make them learn anything. I inquire, I suggest, I offer incentives, but I do not make. I am not their central planner. That job is taken. My job isn't to de uh, decree what they will be good at, or what they will do, or how they will do it. I am not king in their lives. They are sovereign. Their minds belong to them. It's their property after all. My job is to approach them with humility and know that my ability to discern what they are to be, or to do, or to excel in is nothing compared to theirs. My job is to assist them in their discernment. To make experiences, work, play, resources, teachers, mentors, and collaborators available to them to help them as they construct themselves. To talk things through with them, but not talk at all to death. My job is to sit down, shut up, and serve when I can. I direct nothing. Less of me, more of them. I think the sit down, shut up part is a little bit harsh. I think that there's a very you know, significant role that parents play in introducing opportunities and providing exposure element uh, to kids, whether or not they go to school. But, again, I think she's kind of hit the nail on the head. And if you want to follow her, too, her name's Anna Martin, and she goes by the Libertarian Homeschooler on Facebook. C.S. Lewis put it all a little bit more concisely. Of all tyrannies, a tyranny sincerely exercised for the good of the victims may be the most oppressive. Put that on the entrance to every public school. <laughs> Before you help, make sure you're getting consent. Another little story from my life. So let's go back to that summer camp. It's called Deer Crossing Camp. And the first year I went there, I was age 11. And it's a two-week long session. And halfway through the session, we have a campfire. And something weird happened at the campfire that nobody would tell me about. The other first-time campers and I we're all sort of looking at each other because there was some like hushed whispers happening of, between all the old time campers. And so we all lined up at the camp and we we're going to go hike the quarter mile trail through the woods to get to the campfire site. 
And I was told two things. One, I'm not allowed to bring a flashlight or a camera or anything that could produce light. And two, I should look behind me as I'm walking up the trail. I thought, okay, this is a little suspicious, but I'm very excited for my talent show skit. So we go there, we do s'mores, we do the talent show. It's 10.30 at night. We're in the high Sierras of California. It's pitch black, just Milky Way splashed across the sky. And then I learned the great secret of Deer Crossing Camp, which is the first time that you go to Deer Crossing, you walk back from the campfire to the camp alone in the dark. Like one of the most fundamental, primal human fears, walking alone through the dark, where, you know, to an 11 year old's imagination, there are, there's probably, uh, you know, a bear with a cougar riding on its back, <laughs> three, wolf, three wolverines with a horn that's coming out of their mouths, waiting for me around every turn. <coughs> And so I start like, shit, I think my knees were literally shaking uh, on that granite shelf, waiting to go. And then one of the instructors came up and uh, put his hand on my shoulder and he said, don't worry, we've prepared you for this. I realized he was right. So Deer Crossing is a weird, weird place. Um, when you hike in, you hear a story about a Tanaki monster. That's spelled T apostrophe. N A C I Tanaki. Weird thing. And the story goes essentially like this. There was a little kid named Ralph, and he found an egg by a lake one day. And it was the most beautiful egg ever. What colors do you see in the egg? Uh, purple and green and blue. And blue. What a weird egg. <laughs> and as he was holding it, the egg hatched, and out popped a little monster, a Tanaki monster. And it didn't speak, but it went. And it wrote his name in the sand, T apostrophe N A C I. And Ralph became deeply engaged with this monster and claimed it as his own pet. And what do you have to do with a pet? You have to feed a pet. And so Ralph started feeding the pet. And what happens when you feed a pet? It gets bigger. And so Ralph was carrying around the snarky monster in his backpack, but he kept feeding it, and so it got bigger. He had to get one of those little red, uh, what is it, something flyer? Radio flyer. Radio flyer cards to carry it around. And now Ralph was a kid with big dreams. He wanted to run as fast as the wind, climb the highest mountains, and touch the stars. But, as he kept feeding his Tanaki monster, it got bigger and bigger and bigger, and he couldn't do all those things that he wanted to do. I'm doing a very condensed version of the story here. Fast forward, Ralph was 99 years old. He's carrying around this like big old Jabba the Hutt-sized Tanaki monster. Foolish Jedi. And he's at that same lake where he found the egg originally, 99 or whatever, a long time ago. And it's a perfectly clear glass of egg. And the Tanaki monster is wearing his big Tanaki monster name tag, T apostrophe N the C. And Ralph looks back and sees in the reflection on the lake the Tanaki monster's name tag. And it's backwards. He finally realizes what the Tanaki monster is. I can't. Yeah, it's the phrase I can't. And at Deer Crossing Camp, we were told we are not allowed to say I can't. If you feel like you're going to say it, you're supposed to say Tanaki. Instead. So just a word. Everyone's Tanaki. And even better than saying Tanaki, you say, I choose not to. And even better, the best thing to say, instead of I can't is, I could if I. So I'm in a kayaking class at Deer Crossing. And these are whitewater kayaks where you have to like, shove your legs in there. It's not the open top kayaks where if you fall off, you just swim away. These are kayaks where if you fall over, your legs are stuck in a kayak and you drown upside down in the water. Not a great way to go. And so the first thing you have to learn how to do is get out of the kayak. And it looks like this. You bend over forward, you pop your butt out, you slide your legs out straight, and then you are released in about two seconds. And so I learned how to do this thing. It's called the wet exit. I'm paddling around to my first kayaking class. I feel myself tipping over. I'm like, oh, OK, just going to do a wet exit. And I'm an 11-year-old who is gifted with size 12 feet. <laughs> Always had really ridiculously big pound feet. And I get one of my feet stuck in the end of the kayak, and I am trying to pull my leg out. I only get one out; the other one's stuck in there. And I'm this like you know horrible like drowning tortoise situation, <laughs> barely have my head above the water. I'm probably like five feet away from the shore. The instructor's right here. It's not a fundamentally dangerous situation, but I'm saying between coughing and sputtering water, I'm like I can't, I can't do this, I can't. And the instructor is standing right there saying, "You can't, you what? Excuse me, <laughs> what? <laughs> to knock you what?" And so he helps me back, 
And we said, I can't do this. I, I can't kayak. And he said, um, try this. I could if I. And I'd heard this before. So I'm like, oh, okay, I'll do the dumb. I could if I. <laughs> I could if I didn't have giant feet. He said, okay, that's one option. What's another? He said, could if I never took another kayaking class. <laughs> I later became an instructor at this camp, and you get very good at helping young people cycle through kind of joke or throwaway options until they get to the really good stuff. And so I went through a few more I could if I, until I said I could if I kept my legs straight because I was bending them because I really wanted to get out quickly, and uh, yeah, like you taught me. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, let's try that. So the next time I flip over, keep my legs straight, pop out, free in two seconds. I kept kayaking. So deer crossing was an I could get by camp. And everyone took this very seriously. Uh, instructors, if they were ever caught saying Tanaki backwards, <coughs> had a challenge that they would do. Like one instructor would drop and do 10 push ups immediately. Or another one would sing you like a really funny, dumb pop song. The director of the camp would give you $100 on the spot if you caught him saying, I can't. And I saw it happen twice. When I was the assistant director there, I offered fifty dollars and never got caught. What Deer Crossing taught me at a really young age was something that I might have rejected if it was introduced to me later. Like if somebody told me at age eighteen, "Don't say I can't for a whole summer," be like, <laughs> "It's like get, get your self-help hogwash elsewhere." Okay, I'll say whatever I want to say. But at age eleven, it worked. It got in there early, and I learned that if I say these words, I actually change my actions. And the way that I think matters. And it was a real privilege to go back and get to work and be on the other side of that, of that uh, situation. Because you get to say, Tanaki what? Tanaki what? But you also get to work with young people and help them see that for every cage in their mind, there is a key. And again, you can take this stuff and you can go off into the land of like the secret and that's not, not where I want to go with this. But I do believe that our thoughts affect our uh, abilities to make decisions. And our abilities to make decisions is crucial to being a self-directed learner. If you have a bunch of uh, cages, then the first hiccup that you encounter, let's say you're not going to school and you want to learn programming, and you go on to Code Academy, and you start learning JavaScript, but then you get something and it says, else if, and then there's an error. You're like, what? I can't deal with this. I wish that somebody were here to help me. I don't know what to do. I'm out. Back to school. Even if I'm miserable in school. We can apply this to lots of other areas in life, but we don't have enough time for that. By working at Deer Crossing, here are the different cages that I eventually identified and the keys that come to open them. Instead of saying I can't, I said I could if I. Instead of saying I should do something, I say I choose to. Instead of I don't know, I'll find out. I wish, oh, and I hate, two classic things that a teenager will say, that I said a lot of. Those can be turned into, I'll make a plan, and I prefer. And finally, I still struggle with this one. I have to. Oftentimes doesn't mean I have to. It's I get to, or I choose to. Or I've put myself in the position to, <laughs> unfortunately. For every case, there is a key. Anyone know what this stands for? Okay, what does the font look like? <laughs> Although they recently changed their font. Yeah, and the first letter is an L, not a one or a Y or something. And the G stands for Google. Let me Google that for you. Say it louder. Let me Google that for you. Let me Google that for you. <laughs> this is a wonderful website. I'm going to explain its pertinence to self directed learning in just a moment, but here's what I want you to do. The next time you have a friend uh, or an enemy who asks a question that, to put it nicely, is not a smart question. <laughs> and honestly, it's one of those questions that they really should have just Googled themselves. But instead, in their sloth, they have asked you, the unwitting victim, to answer the question that they could have Googled themselves. Next time that happens, I want you to be a little snarky. <laughs> and I want you to go to lmgtfy.com. 
and you can create a link that has a Google search term. So for example, if your friend asks, uh, what, you know, is this pizza place open at 11 p.m.? Like, I don't know, I should just Google it. <laughs> you type in, is Princeton Pizza open, uh, what, or Princeton Pizza hours, like that's what a rational person would Google, right? And then you get a let me Google that for you link. And then you send that link to your friend, like text him. And then they're like, oh, you're like, here's your answer, link. Like, oh, what's this? And they click on it. It opens up a Google window in their browser, moves their cursor over to the search bar, <laughs> and types in Princeton Pizza Hours. And then moves the cursor down to the search button, clicks it for them, and then says, was that so hard? <laughs> I don't know who made this site, but they're wonderful. <laughs> and let me Google that for you represents a, uh, a fundamental fact of our era which is that self-sufficiency is not only a beneficial thing, but it's kind of becoming a required thing in the digital era. And it's especially required for anyone who wants to be a self-directed learner, somebody who wants to thrive outside of a traditional knowledge-transmitting institution. What I like about Let Me Google That for you is that it puts, you back, it puts the responsibility back in the learner's position which is fundamentally what we're doing with self-directed learning. We're saying it's not about teachers, per se. Teachers can be helpful. They can be very useful. They can be wonderful, life-changing people. But it is fundamentally my responsibility to answer my own questions. And before I have any significant question, any problem that I have, any curiosity that I have, the responsible thing to do is for me to Google it first and see what humanity has already decreed about this question or concern. And if you don't do that, if you're not in the habit of Googling your own dreams or problems or questions, then you will be left behind, if that's my idea, in the modern era of learning. There's a great uh, school critic, former teacher, named Will Richardson. And he has a couple very practical suggestions for uh, reforming schools. He said, first one is, every test should be open phone, which means, you can have your phone connected to the internet, and you can answer anything you want. You can look up anything you want. How would that change testing, just as a singular rule? Another thing he says is, teachers, this is your mission. Be more interesting than a PlayStation. Yeah. If you can do that, then you no longer have to rely upon all these tricks and gimmicks to try to maintain attention. It will just be given to you. If you're not Googling stuff, you're not being a good self-directed learner. Here are a few ways you can test yourself about how good of a Googler am I. Imagine you're going to a job interview and you really want to impress the person. Can you find, you know, if you have the name of the person who's interviewing you, can you go onto Facebook and LinkedIn and Twitter or just Google this person's name and find out who they are and what they did and what their work is all about? And maybe even find out what this company is all about and come in with a proactive <laughs> suggestion. It's like, your company's doing really good work. I saw your quarterly sales, but you would consider a stronger social media presence. Oh my gosh, you're probably gonna be a little bit better than me. This job sounds better than the McDonald's person. <laughs> Can you find the email address of an important person? I'll talk about this a little more later, but can you connect with anyone who seems interested in work well on the internet and scour through all the, the BS and the false leads out there to actually find a critical piece of information like an email? Can you teach yourself practical stuff, like install a window or how to butcher a chicken? YouTube University is the best thing that may have ever happened to like on-demand practical learning. Can you get directions anywhere? Can you read different perspectives on the same piece of news so you're not just beholden to the same political agenda of whichever news outlet you consider to be the right one? This is the power of somebody who knows how to Google, and this is why I think that these things like, should not be banned. I don't even think they should be highly restricted. The whole like screen time for little kids thing, I think jury's out on that, but this is a learning machine. Imagine having this in the year 1850 and having like internet connections, you know? Like, <laughs> imagine you had 4G service to the present, but you were in 1850, okay? You would be a god with this. <laughs> if you don't know how to use it now, or if you're severely restricted in your years, then you are less godlike than you might otherwise be. 
for every good question, start by asking the internet. But the internet and digital technology in general is not our savior. There are people out there who will try to convince you otherwise. And what I like to think of is uh, the story of MOOCs. MOOC, M-O-O-C, Massive Open Online Courseware, became very popular back in roughly 2005 when Stanford and MIT and a few other big name institutions announced that they were going to be sharing uh, lectures from some of their top professors online for free. Now, it's not very revolutionary now, but 10 years ago, there's just a huge thing. The doors to the Ivy League are being flung open. Now anyone who wants to get a Princeton University education can do it from the convenience of their bedroom. But MOOCs did not really take off as much as their proponents thought they would. Why? Anyone out there have any guesses about why not every one of us is sitting at home watching Princeton lectures in our spare time? Because many people who are, are listening to them are, are listening to them because they want the degree the results from being in the lecture, not the actual information. And yeah, many of the people in the lectures are actually probably doing this, right? <laughs> <laughs> What's another reason? Why aren't you going home to watch an Ivy League college lecture tonight? Kind of boring. I like interacting with people. Lots of good reasons for this. Um, the world did not crumble. The, the Ivy Leagues are, still exist, and they're even more uh, highly coveted than they were 10 years ago. And the people who ended up using MOOCs the most were actually people who already had undergraduate educations, and people who from foreign countries with really mediocre um, higher education systems. Like, there's a lot of people from India and Pakistan who watch uh, MOOCs here in the US. So we're kind of doing a service to like the rest of the world by publishing this stuff. Um, probably you know, a net gain for everyone. But online education is not going to save us or save you or save your child. Because human face-to-face -face interaction still matters more than anything else and perhaps matters more than ever. This is a image from a program I've run a number of times called the Writing Retreat. And the Writing Retreat is a very basic uh, concept. Has anyone ever heard of NaNoWriMo? Yes, of course. Have you done a NaNoWriMo? Attempted to. Attempted. I've attempted twice and failed twice. <laughs> yes. NaNoWriMo is an acronym that stands for National Novel Writing Month. And this guy, Chris Beatty, who is a freelance journalist based in San Francisco, really wanted to write a novel. And when he tried to start a novel, he couldn't finish it. And every time he started, he failed. And so he decided that for one month, he was going to put away all of his excuses. And he was just going to produce words. He was going to turn off his inner editor. And crucially, he was going to do it with his friends, who were also trying to write novels for the first time. And so he started this thing called National Novel Writing Month. For the month of November, try to write 50,000 words and just produce a first draft. Stop worrying about tweaking it as you go along. Get something that you can call your own. And do it with other people, crucially. And this thing has taken off. There are millions of people who attempt NaNoWriMo every November this year. And a lot of them are young people. And a lot of them happen to be doing like kind of alternative education stuff. And so I realized that I could probably get two of them together, throw them into a beach house in Oregon, and let each of them attempt to write their own novel for a month. And it would require very little effort on my part, aside from feeding them. You know. It's like the velociraptors, you know, you throw the <laughs> cow leg in there every once in a while. No, they're lovely. And the writing retreat worked out really well, and it continues to work out well. And the idea is these people are all writing on their own because they're interested in writing. There might be one writing workshop a day, but otherwise, I'm not in a position of motivating them or cajoling them or overly inspiring them. I'm available on demand to help them if they have like a question about character development or grammar or something. But mostly, they write on their own. And they're writing because other people around them are writing too. It's a positive peer pressure. And that's the kind of stuff that online is not going to be able to reproduce anytime soon until this you know, technological singularity comes and we're all you know, matrix-like slaves to uh, the high point. Hopefully that won't be soon. And this is what I kind of came to realize as the power of working alone together. 
if you're working alone, like this mythological self-directed learner who goes home and learns everything on the internet by his or herself, that doesn't actually exist very often, or at least not for very long. The coolest and most productive self-directed learners I know have found little communities of people who share their interests, their passions, their weird, you know, trebuchet fetishes, and they all work together. But sometimes they're doing, they're doing their own projects, but just in the same space. It's the idea of a co-working space or a cafe. We want to be socially present and have people to talk to and connect to, but still have autonomy for our projects. Self-directed learning is not self-isolated learning. Don't try to do it all by yourself, and don't try to reinvent the wheel every time. All right, to get near the end here. This young lady is named Emma. She lives just outside of New Haven. I met her about a year ago at a talk that I was giving at a similar uh, place to Princeton Learning Center that's up in New Haven. And she told me, in classic homeschooler style, that she is totally into Vikings. <laughs> that is her thing. She discovered Vikings at age 11 and read all the books she could find about Vikings, and then textbooks, and then watched all the documentaries. And instead of, she was going to get a sweet 16 uh, birthday party, and she said, can I just not have that party and not have like the next two Christmases and birthdays? And can you help me go to London, mom and dad, so I can see this Viking exhibit that's there right now? So she did. She's Viking crazy. <laughs> and then she discovered that Yale University had a new professor who was leading a class on what? Vikings. Vikings. <laughs> and she said, I've got to get into that class. The only problem, she's 16, homeschooler, not many formal credentials, and certainly is not going to, you know, Yale doesn't let people just audit classes willingly. And so she, with the help of her mom, emailed the professor. You can find this guy's email address on the Yale website. It's very easy. And she said, hi, I'm Emma. I'm 16. I'm super into Vikings. Here are the reasons I'm super into Vikings. I would be so, I live, I live 20 minutes outside of Yale. Can I please, please, please sit in on your class? Please. What did the professor say? Sure. You know, some professors might say no, because they're too busy, they might just might not respond, or maybe there's too much liability involved. But this one said yes. She came in, she got to meet the professor, he gave her a copy of his new Viking book, Fangirl. <laughs> <laughs> and she got to sit in on the Viking books. There's another story about a kid named Jonah, up in the, he went to North Star, and he did the same thing with the chemistry class at UMass Amherst. He wrote the professor, no, he didn't email her. He went up and walked into the class on the first day of an intro chemistry class, required for most you know, biology and chem majors, and said, I'm really interested in chemistry. Is there any way I could sit down in your class, please? How many intro chemistry professors <laughs> do you think have some young person, not even a college professor, but some young person walk up and be like, please let me take chemistry 101. No great sir. <laughs> Of course, he let him do it. And he didn't, you know, get official credit for it, but he got to participate in all the assignments, he took the tests, and then he uh, got a letter of recommendation from the professor to go to the next level in the chemistry class, which he actually did enroll in for credit at UMass Amherst, even though he was a middle school dropout. This is the power of connecting with individuals who you find interesting, fascinating, or perhaps could be useful to you in some way, not just in a one way, but in like a, a reciprocal way. And I think this is a reciprocal situation because these professors are getting something out of a really passionate, curious young person, approaching them and being enthusiastic and having a discussion. And so when I work with teenagers nowadays, almost always some of my assignments or activities for them include finding a handful of people who you think are interesting or fascinating or doing work that you want to do, maybe somehow, one day, and just write them an email. Do this. Here, here's your, your primer, okay? And write a few genuine paragraphs. Get your parents or somebody else who is writing your trust to proofread it, and then shoot it off there. Like this. As a parent, you might be concerned, like, oh, my kid's meeting with a stranger. Yes, have that 10-minute conversation, and meet only in a public place. Or maybe, like, you know, if you're a parent, you can camp out in front of the Starbucks with a little, you know, spy glass, and make sure everything's cool with the Yale professor. Um, but this is one of those things that self-directed learners can do, especially young self-directed learners who have more of the benefit of the doubt. Like if I'm, say, 27, and I email 
the UMass Amherst professor, like, please let me sit on your chemistry course. And he'd be like, why don't you sign up for the college? <laughs> Freeloader? <laughs> if you're young, you have the unique opportunity to do this kind of stuff. And all that you have to lose is a little bit of ego. And all that you have to gain are incredible connections and resources and opportunities. Do this more. And do this now, all of you, at your own age. Find somebody who you love and who you want to reach out to. And just send them a nice email. Good chance they'll never respond to you, but in the off chance they do, it's going to be awesome. I do it all the time. Okay, last story. We're at the end here. This is Carsey Blanton. She's another not back to school camp person. This just happens to be the community from which I know most of my kind of case studies. And a lot of questions get asked about what happens to these kids who don't go to regular school. They go to some weird thing like PLC, or they go to a Waldorf <laughs> school, or they just homeschool or unschool all their lives. And maybe they go to college, maybe they don't. It's a lot easier for us to imagine success with the kid who does all the weird stuff and then goes to college. Because after college, when you have the degree and the, you know, the pedigree, nobody cares. Right? I'm not going up and ask, hey, what are you doing in 10th grade, man? It's like, that's just not, or like, what's your SATs for? <laughs> no, only ables do that. <laughs> we do ask, where do you go to school, meaning college? And that's our sort of, you know, little spot test of, as to whether you are part of our educated tribe or not. So it's really easy to imagine success for weird K-12 K through 12 experiences leading to college. But imagining success without college is like jumping way far off the deep end for a long time. And when I think about that, and I think about how young people who really forsake traditional education get along in this world, here's one of my operating models, Carsey Blanton. Uh, she never went to school, ever. At age five, her parents looked at her. Uh, she grew up on a rural piece of land in Virginia and said, you're pretty happy. We're not going to send you to school, because that might ruin that. And so she just never went to school. And she got to hang around on her farm and play with salamanders and read a bunch of books. And her, friend, her parents brought over interesting people to talk to, you know, have dinner parties, that kind of stuff. And then at age 13, she picked up an acoustic guitar. And that was kind of the beginning of the end for Carsey. Um, she noodled around with that guitar as much as she could. She taught herself stuff online. And then she started going here, on back to school camp, where she met a bunch of uh, other artists. And some of these other artists were a little bit older than her, and they were forming a, an artist house, sort of neo-commune, in Eugene, Oregon, where many such experiments happen. <laughs> and Carsey was 16 at this point, and she got invited to go live with a bunch of 18 and 19 year olds in Eugene, Oregon. They were all mu musicians and artists. And she pitched this to her parents, and her parents, in very bold, trusting, unschooly parent fashion, said, Yes, we will support you in doing this. Slash, we can't really stop you. <laughs> and so she went out. She started her life as uh, a musician. She took every odd job she could to get through this, this early transitional period. A big break came when she got invited to tour the US with a funk band at age 18. And so she got to go all around. And she started teaching swing dancing, a skill that she picked up, to make money on the side and start building up a little bit of an audience for her buddy music career. She starts writing her own stuff. She's still working at cafes to pay the bills. And in her early 20s, she gets her next break, which is uh, getting an invitation. You know, she kind of worked her way up to this. It's not like funk band to Paul Simon. But she got to open for Paul Simon on his tour. Then she got to tour with the Wood Brothers. At this point, she's put out, a, she's self-published a couple of CDs. She's age 26. And she's going for the big kahuna now. She wants to do a jazz album. And she needs a bunch of money to hire the other, art, the other musicians to do this and to produce some really cool tracks. And she goes on Kickstarter and creates a campaign. And she tries to raise $29,000 for her jazz album. At this point, she's toured around the US a couple of times. She's taught a lot of dance. She's done some of her own shows. She's got a mailing list. She's pretty good at self-promotion. And at the end of her Kickstarter campaign, she does not have $29,000. She has $62,000. It's enough to fund her, I believe one of her stretch goals was, if she got to $60,000, she would go tour in Australia. And so this funded the album, 
a nationwide tour and some international tour, and became one of her like revenue streams for being a self-employed singer-songwriter. Carsey represents to me uh, somebody who has eked her way into the middle of this diagram. There's a lot going on here. Let me explain. This is a sort of uh, how people live their lives breakdown Venn diagram. Let's say you have just something that is a passion. You love to do it, but you have no skill in it, and nobody will pay you to do it. We call that being a fan. Right? If you like watching soccer, but you're no good at soccer, and nobody will pay you to watch TV, and you are a soccer fan. Congratulations. As soon as you get some skill with your passion, but still nobody will pay you for it, you have a hobby. Think of the model train collector. Right? Good for you, man. I'm not going to pay you to make those model trains. OK, go over here. Take the passion out of it. You no longer care about what you're doing, but you're good at it, and people will pay you to do that. Call that a job. Carsey took a number of jobs in her career, working as a barista, um, I think, you know, in many ways, teaching dance is not always a, a fantastic thing. That was just a job for her also. Until she could start moving into this direction. Of course, over here, if you want to do something, people do get paid for it, but you have no talent. That's a dream job. You've got to, the, you've got to move the talent direction. And so Carsey started with uh, this, with the acoustic guitar, it became this. She moonlighted to get enough money until she could migrate into the middle of this diagram. And to me, this represents, and Carsey's story illustrates, what self-directed learning is preparing young people for. It's for finding your way into the middle. And I realize that not everyone necessarily wants to be in the middle. There are many good ways to live life by having a job for part of the day, and then doing your other stuff the other part of the day. Or maybe the job like funds you know, other people's dreams, and that's a good thing too. But what I feel like really connects the type of people who I've ended up working with, and who seem to get into this lifestyle, is the desire to exist here. And the desire not to wait until age 18 or 22 or beyond to start that mission. Like getting, that's a really hard thing to do. And you need to have a lot of discussions. You need to have a lot of trial and experiment and failure and recuperation. And when you are choosing to be an unschooler or a self-directed learning center participant, or whatever you want to call it, then my belief is that you are starting this mission, this challenge, just sooner than the average person does. And it's kind of like what life is like if you don't have a teacher or a curriculum telling you what to do. You have to figure out where you are in this chart every single day. If you're a young person, you don't have to worry about getting paid yet. But you won't be young for very long. And I think that some of the coolest and most engaging activities that I've ended up doing with young people have involved actually producing stuff of value for other people, essentially entrepreneurship at a younger age than, than most. That is where people go with self-directed learning, in my humble opinion. That is the art of self-directed learning. And if you'd like to connect with me a little bit more, here are the sites to do it. If you want to find out about the programs that I run for teenagers and for college-age people, go to my website, unschooladventures.com. If you forgot about Blake Club, that's facebook.com slash Blake Club. And if you forget any of this stuff or you don't write it down, what can you do when you get home? Google it. Just Google me. Yes, you'll find all of it. Thank you very much for coming. Blake is trying to get down to Philadelphia tonight, and uh, we had signed up for the room until 8.15, but I think the person who was supposed to close up left and just asked us to close up. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think we'll just keep rolling with it. <laughs> um, so, I don't do you want to do Q&A? Yeah, I'd rather sign, sign and sell some books. Would mm -hmm. you have some Q&A? Yeah. Anybody want to stick around for some questions? Okay. Or, let me put this out there. Please leave if you don't want to be here. Consent, right? Consent. <laughs> uh, but if you want to hang out and do Q&A, uh, let's stick around for about 10 minutes and we'll do some like large group Q&A. And then we'll break. And if you want to talk to me, if you, if you want to get a book and get it signed, um, just come grab me. I'll sign it for you. Yeah, I appreciate